Gaijin Entertainment presents The Shooting Range You are watching The Shooting Range, a weekly show for all tankers and airmen of War Thunder. In this episode, Plywood Wonder and the Squadron of Furies. The greatest raid of all, how the Brits stormed Saint Nazaire. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with everything we can tell you about naval warfare. We've kept you in the dark for a long time. You've kept bombarding us with questions nevertheless. And finally, we can give you some answers. First and foremost, the closed beta is almost here. It will start later this year. There are two ways to get in. You can be invited or you can purchase one of the two naval starter packs with unique ships, which are available in our store right now. The open beta phase will start next year. The same question was popping up over and over again. What nations will get ships? The answer is simple. All of them. Every side of the conflict will get its own fleet. What's important is that we've decided to focus on the fast attack based craft, such as torpedo boats, which are rarely reproduced in games. Our internal testing showed that battles with large battleships would be too long and boring or require design changes that made ships entirely unrealistic. And that's not the outcome that we're interested in. At the same time, you're still likely to see some bigger ships, first in the form of AI-controlled enemy vessels, and later, if we're happy with the results of the closed beta, as an integral part of the naval research tree. Speaking about research, with ships, everything will be the same. You get research points during matches and later can spend them to get new ships and unlock new modules. Well, you know how it works. Needless to say, we're making some new spectacular maps for naval warfare. You're going to fight in every naval theater of the war, in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, in the Arctic, and also in the Mediterranean Sea. We're proud to say that the water surfaces in all new locations are created using NVIDIA WaveWorks. So get ready for some breathtaking views. The full list of the first ships to enter the fray is going to be revealed at Gamescom. The visitors of Gamescom 2016 will also be the first to try the new mode. For those unable to visit the exhibition, and frankly that will be the majority of us, there will be a special video broadcast from our booth and new dev blog updates each day. Stay tuned! The last bit of information, we're also working on a mixed battles involving ships. The mode where ships and aircraft are fighting together is being tested right now. Well, to make the wait a little bit easier, we're going to tell you a few wartime stories that couldn't happen without the fast and deadly Knights of the Sea. Pearl Harbor changed everything. The United States had to enter a full-scale war. For the US Armed Forces, the timing wasn't ideal, and doubly so for the Allied forces that were defending Philippines. All the big ships had left for the safety of the Dutch East Indies, the fleet consisted of a few submarines and the Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 3, a detachment of six torpedo boats. The Americans called them patrol torpedo boats or PT boats. The ever sharp-witted sailors called these vessels plywood wonder. These comparatively fragile boats with their wooden hulls were certainly not for the faint of heart. Luckily, Lieutenant John Bulkley, who commanded Motorboat Squadron 3, certainly did not lack in courage department. Later, he will play quite a big role in the war and will retire a vice admiral. At the start of the war, though, he was in charge of the small mosquito fleet in the seas around Philippines. And his boats definitely didn't fool around. For example, one night Bulkley's boys spotted an enemy ship, a Japanese cruiser screened by four destroyers. Apparently, no prey was too big for these guys. Without much ado, they fired their torpedoes. In the end, the Americans had to pay for their reckless bravery. One of the boats went down. But they were able to damage the Japanese cruiser Kuma, and that's what counts. No wonder the Japanese called these little vessels devil boats. But the Bulkley's finest hour came in March 1942. By that time, the detachment diminished to just four PTs, including Bulkley's PT-41. The future looked grim for the defenders of the islands. It was decided that General Douglas MacArthur 
was commanding the Allied forces in the region had to leave Philippines and relocate to Australia. It seems that MacArthur wasn't particularly fond of submarines. He decided to go by Bulkley's boat, to be exact. Now, you have to consider this. Yeah, Bulkley, whom the general once described as that bold buckaroo with the cold green eyes, was probably his best choice for that daring mission. But the lieutenant's PTs that were not known for particular sturdiness in the first place had to cross over 600 nautical miles, or about 1,000 kilometers of open ocean, while also breaking through Japanese lines. And they did it. Saving the lives of MacArthur, his family, and his staff. It is small wonder that on arriving to safety, MacArthur told Bulkley, You have taken me out of the jaws of death. I shall never forget it. And now let's leave the warm waters of the Far East to speak about a suicidal attack on the most important dry dock of the Third Reich. The colossal German battleship Tirpitz was a serious problem. This marvel of engineering could single-handedly act as a deterrent against an Allied invasion, and that's saying something. Head-on attack on such a ship did not sound very tempting. In the end, the British decided to take a different approach. There was only a handful of places around the world that could accommodate the German monstrosity in case it needed repairs. And there was only one safe haven available on the Atlantic coast, the French dock of Saint-Nazaire. No dock, no repairs, so the dock had to be destroyed. The problem was that the Admiralty refused to spare even a single functional destroyer as they were likely to be lost during the assault. That's why when the British got ready for the mission, the attacking force consisted of a group of motor launches and the obsolete HMS Campbellton. That was originally US destroyer USS Buchanan. There was a twist though. The ship was packed with delayed action explosives. So yeah, a floating time bomb and a flotilla of 16 motor launches had to take down the heavily defended dock at Saint Nazaire. The British plan was simple. Use HMS Campbellton to ram the dock and then blow it sky high. The motorboats were supposed to land a small force of commandos to destroy machinery and defense structures. The German plan was even simpler, not to let the Royal Navy in and preferably not to get blown up. On the evening of the 26th of March, the British Conway left Falmouth, Cornwall. On the 27th, RAF organized a series of bombing runs against the German positions at Saint-Nazaire, which failed to produce any meaningful results and only made the defenders of the port extra watchful. Everyone was placed on a heightened state of alert, and the commander of the German forces ordered extra attention to be paid to the approaches to the harbor. Brilliant. At 0122, with the Conway roughly one mile from the dock gates, the British ships were illuminated by the German searchlights, and soon all hell broke loose. Every German gun in the bay opened fire, but it was a little too late. While being constantly hit by the enemy shells, Campbellton rushed across the harbor and around the dock gates, driving the ship 33 feet inside. A few moments later, the commandos poured from Campbellton, looking for their targets. That was when the first motorboats started to arrive through the barrage. Boat number 156 got hit at least once while trying to disembark its assault team, but miraculously was able to get away to the open sea. Numbers 192 and 262 went down, only five people from the crew surviving the ordeal. Most of the boats had been destroyed on the run-in, but a few of them managed to disembark their commandos that immediately tried to locate their targets under heavy enemy fire. The sea was aflame. Aboard ML-306, Sergeant Thomas Durand was spraying the Germans with bullets with his twin Lewis gun. He refused to leave his post even after he was wounded in the head, both arms, legs, chest and his stomach. And even after ML-306 was attacked at short range by the German torpedo boat Jaguar. His gun stopped firing only when M his gun stopped firing only when ML-306 was finally boarded by Germans. Durand was posthumously awarded a Victoria Cross, the only such award given to a soldier in a naval action and on the recommendation of the enemy commander. It wasn't all in vain, though. In the morning, Campbellton went up in flames and with it, a few dozen of German officers that were inspecting the vessel at that very moment. Needless to say, the dock was destroyed. 
In the end, only 228 men out of 662 got back to the friendly shores. 169 Brits were captured after they ran out of ammo. Five got through the town and escaped into the countryside. Much later, with some aid from the French resistance, they got home through Spain. As it often happens, both sides counted it as a victory. But what we know for sure is that no Tirpitz ever got his chance to get his repairs at the dock of St. Nazaire. Finally, it's time for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline, developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official forums. Here we'll have a more light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. We'll hope you like it. Michael Moy asks, will Gaijin implement a mechanism to punish team killers in custom battles? Hello, Michael. We actually have a special system that finds players like this and bans them. It doesn't happen with the first kill, though, so you have to be a serious offender. And in custom battles, the host can also simply kick the players that are too busy fighting their own teammates. Power to the people. A guy called Thunder CZ says, Night battles are rare, and why are they rare? Well, basically because night fighting is not very popular. Same thing with extreme weather conditions. We know that some people really enjoy the challenge, though. That's why you can easily make yourself a night map in custom battles. I hope that helps. Then a question from Not Enough Data. Will submarines be part of naval combat? This question has been asked a lot, so here it is again, guys. We haven't even introduced naval battles to the game yet, and you are already asking questions about specific content. Jeez. But we can say that we're not planning to have submarines in War Thunder, at least at the very start. Subs are fascinating, but also rather slow. And we want to see some fast action that will get your blood boiling, so they do not really match our profile. Finally, a very important question from Benjamin. Why did Update 1.61 come out so fast? Uh, sorry about that, it's a real shame, we know. We just wanted to introduce a very important mechanic called Reinforcement as fast as we could. Sorry again, we'll be slower next time. This is it for the day, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. See you all in the shooting range.